traffic. It's the one thing that brings Toronto together. Motorists, transit users, cyclists, pedestrians, everybody hates traffic, and yet it's literally everywhere we turn, stopping us from getting where we want to go. Oliver Moore is the Globe and Mail's urban transportation columnist. He recently called traffic, quote, electoral gold, and even said that frustrated drivers are shaping up to be this election's key voting bloc. But it doesn't matter what candidate you support, or even if you plan to vote. Traffic taking the stage as an election issue has made it clear that Toronto needs to green light some changes when it comes to the flow of our roads. Later this episode, we'll hear from Phil Lamb. His startup is designing new vehicles specifically for Toronto streets. We'll also hear from a human geography professor named Zach Taylor. He's going to explain why the issue of traffic is so political in Toronto. And tell us about the fourth-year students he's teaching who are doing groundbreaking research on the mayoral election. But first, an international award-winning U of T expert who's combined game theory with artificial intelligence to revolutionize traffic. And it's all about smarter traffic lights. This is the U of T Cities podcast. I'm Brianna Goldberg. In this special four-part miniseries, you'll hear about the University of Toronto researchers and entrepreneurs pushing boundaries on some of the upcoming election's most important issues. We'll introduce you to our big thinkers and researchers making things that will literally change your life. For example... Okay, my name is Sana Hilton Bowie. I'm doing postdoctoral research. She's just one of the many people at U of T changing what traffic means and how it works all around the world. The smarter traffic light system she's building with Professor Beher Abdulhai is called Marlin. And El Tantawi's PhD research tested Marlin in traffic simulations, but now it's commercialized and about to be tested on actual roads in the city of Burlington. It's combining game theory and complex communications, but El Tantawi says it's easy to understand if you just think about sports similar to players in a soccer game so everyone wants to score but the ultimate goal is to for the whole team to win so they are keep coordinating together so the, our system marlin works as a brain that sits at the traffic light and this brain allows the traffic light to react to the traffic conditions in real time by updating the timings in second by second basis to minimize the waiting time for the cars at the intersection while coordinating these actions or decisions with the neighboring intersections in order to minimize the drain the whole network. So the, the traffic lights will be uh, like talking to each other and saying, I have lots of people here, so you need to allow more flow down the road. Is that what you mean? Exactly, exactly. Yeah, they are sending their sensor information to each other. And uh, like in the algorithm itself, the decision is made uh, t- by taking into consideration their, the expected decisions that their, these neighbors are going to take. So everyone like kind of building is building a, a mental map of the others and try to take uh, its action according to the others' actions. So how does it get its information? Is it through these sensors in the road that you're talking about? Yeah, through these sensors. And they're going to be communicating through either Ethernet network or even wirelessly. Uh, and then the sensors themselves are cameras, video cameras, and uh, that can get this uh, Q-Lens information to the intersection, and then the intersection can send this information to the neighbors and receive the others as well. What do you think traffic could look like if this was implemented widely? So based on, again, the simulation uh, results that we have tested, we have found that it can have savings of 30 to 40 percent uh, in the delay. What got you interested in this problem of traffic in the first place? Uh, well, of course, all of us like face this uh, day in daily basis when we get frustrated w- waiting at <laughs> traffic lights or stuck in anywhere. I mean, in traffic, and I was living most of my time in like Arab countries and specifically Egypt. And uh, this problem is uh, the main problem in in Egypt. So when I n- knew about the intelligent transportation systems, and this happened like kind of I luck or chance because my my husband was came here to study the PhD with Professor Beher Abdelhai so this was the first time for me to 
know about uh, the intelligent transportation systems and I, and I found it very exciting for me that I can use theoretical concepts that I have learned in communication, control theory, and also mathematics in solving one of the main <laughs> problems that we face over there. And uh, when I came here, I also found that it's, again, in every um, large city is is a problem. So I have worked with Professor Beher, and from day one, he was talking about the implementation on streets, like for, for a PhD student who's <laughs> just starting. Oh, <laughs> it was too early for that. But uh, like, he transferred this like passion to me, and we uh, we were always working on this target in mind that we need to finish this work and try to implement it in the street. Do you see this model being transferred to countries overseas? Yes, definitely. It works with any city that has the issue of variable uh, traffic on the different approaches with intersection, like the traditional way of coordination in the current systems is to have a green wave along an arterial assuming that the major demand is this just along that arterial and we want every car to pass through uh, the intersection to the other in a green wave all of them are green but this will not work in a grid network for example like Toronto where there is high demand and variable demand in all approaches so um, so we might see this uh, making traffic smarter uh, in other places other than Toronto. Well, we hope so. We, we have a couple of meetings with uh, cities from Mexico. Do you drive in the city? Well, I <laughs> I will have my driving <laughs> test, driving road test uh, in October 6th, so I'm not driving. But I feel precious because my husband is driving and I'm sitting uh, beside him. And... Uh, of course, it's going to be <laughs> different when I am driving by myself. Yeah. That was Sama El Tantawi. She is a postdoctoral researcher at U of T working on the Marlin Adaptive Traffic Signal Control. You can read more about her at news.utoronto.ca. Coming up in a few minutes, we'll hear from Professor Zach Taylor on why traffic gets so political in Toronto. But first, the vehicle of the future runs on your own two feet. What does traffic look like to you? Is it an endless line of cars with exhaust fumes rising up on the horizon? Bikes squeaking in between the lanes, taking chances at getting knocked over by a much larger vehicle? Maybe pedestrians plodding along as they breathe in all this pollution? Well, if the team behind a new company called Wheelspan gets its way, these tired old pieces of the traffic puzzle could be replaced by sleek, safe, human-electric hybrid pods. The company's growing with help from one of U of T's startup hubs specifically geared towards scientists turned entrepreneurs. It's called the Impact Center. And in the driver's seat of this company is Phil Lam, co-founder of Wheelspan. Our company um, is in urban transportation, and we're interested in building a product that fits into uh, cities. So we're looking at transportation of less than a few kilometers, uh, moving from place to place inside cities, wonderful cities, old, older cities that we have quite a few of in North America, so cities like uh, Vancouver, Toronto, Montreal, uh, New York, Boston, San Francisco, Austin, Texas, uh, places like that. And the reason we're doing this is because we've looked at transportation as it is today, and we've said, well, if not broken, then at the very least there are things we could change, we could make better. Um, we're coming from a point of view of saying uh, transportation should be green, uh, it should be good for the environment, it should be good for the city, it should be good for the people who are using it, it should be healthy, uh, it should be predictable, it should be comfortable, convenient. And we've centered around those principles um, that we think will fit into cities better than any of the existing alternatives. Uh, so tell me, um, how will this end up affecting people's lives? What could, what could it improve? So maybe it's best to talk about use cases, so examples. So you might imagine um, if you compare, say, to a, someone who currently drives to work, uh, driving to work can be a very stressful experience. Uh, it's also very expensive. Um, from a health standpoint, driving is one of the worst things that you can do to your body. Um, it's almost as bad as sitting at a desk, uh, simply because your body essentially wastes away. Um, if you use something like we're designing or a bicycle or something that's human powered, even walking is incredibly healthy in comparison. 
Um, so to give you an example, uh, in North America, you're more than 10 times as likely to get injured cycling somewhere than you are driving. And yet the health advantages of, of cycling outweigh even that additional risk. Um, so it's healthier, even when you take into account accidents and other unfortunate happenstances, to cycle than it is to drive, which is very unintuitive, but unfortunately true. If you, if you think about someone who lives in a, in a dense city, uh, parking can be a real issue. Management of, of, of vehicles can be a real issue. So you can think about a use case where you might want a vehicle that you can use as, say, uh, for example, as a sort of in the role of a, of a second car. So you might want to take a quick trip to the grocery store or you might want to drop off uh, your, your child at daycare. Um, all of these things are short trips meant for either one or two people that, that, are, that, that you want to be easy, you want them to be predictable and, and simple uh, and safe at the same time. Uh, so you might want to find, so, you, so our product is, is something that can, that can achieve all of those things um, without the hassle of the different ty- other, ty- other types of transportation that are currently available. How did you get interested in um, solving this problem? So when, when I started grad school, um, I was commuting in from Mississauga, from one of the outer suburbs. Um, and for me, it was it was sort of a natural step because at the time, Go Transit had just installed bike racks on all their buses. So I figured, okay, well, I could buy a bicycle and I could just take it with me, and that worked out really nicely. Except for the fact that it's really scary <laughs> to cycle in Toronto, and I've heard that it's very it's very scary to cycle in other cities as well. Um, I had, I mean, I've I've fallen into streetcar tracks. I've been almost run over. You know, I've been like I've been run off the road. Um, and and all of that was actually still preferable to taking the TTC, <laughs> which is which is really um, which isn't isn't you know that's not the TTC's fault and it's not it's not a problem with public transportation it's just a problem with the way public transportation fits into our existing infrastructure, um, and so the original design concept was for was for something that was that was supposed to address those needs and. And it was more of a, a, a like a project for myself, and and it turns out other people were interested, and and then the concept grew because at some point you you can only involve so many people w- w- by saying, well, this is a project for my own interest, <laughs> and and um, and it turns out that there's a real need, and so we said, okay, well, how can we how can we expand on this concept to create something that that actually fits the needs of, of a substantially large enough portion of people to really make an impact. And so, how did um, how did your experience at U of T help you develop that idea into an actual company? It's just a natural place to pick up the kind of attitude that and the skills required to be able to say, "Well, there's a problem. Let's just fix it." Um, the Impact Center, in particular, has been instrumental in supporting us because they looked at our concept and said, "Well, that's cool. How can we help you?" And and it's really neat because they they take a they you know they took us on, on with the understanding that we were kind of uh, rather how shall I say l- less skilled than was necessary to really form <laughs> a functioning business and and they just kind of looked at that and said well you know we'll help you get there um, and so we can't be grateful enough for that um, as as sort of a place to develop ideas that are non technical and so p- political cultural. Um, the University of Toronto is a fantastic place to meet and really and, and to meet people who are like-minded who can help you develop ideas about the way we live, um, the way we interact with our built environment and our society. And there's lots of people here that will encourage that kind of thinking that's essentially, well, look at what we have, understand that it could be better, and take the time to really critically reflect on what changes you could make. Phil Lamb and his team at Wheelspan design innovative green vehicles developing with help from U of T's Impact Center. Find out more at news.utoronto.ca. Toronto's upcoming election isn't just an opportunity to weigh in on leadership, it's also a great chance to learn more about what's important to the city and the people who live and drive in it. Professor Zach Taylor teaches urban politics and local government at U of T's Scarborough campus. For him, traffic is at the core of the central drama driving politics in Toronto, the tension of the GTA's amalgamation. We have these stereotypes of the Starbucks voter and the Tim Hortons voter and so on, the the automobile uh, 
oriented suburbanite versus the transit riding downtowner. And these are caricatures, but I think they're, they're worth uh, trying to unpack and explore and figure out what the politics of this means when it all happens inside a single city council, a single municipality, a single electorate. Because that's not what happens in Vancouver. It's not what happens in almost every American city. These two areas have their own municipalities. Their politics are separated from each other. It's these kinds of dramas and frictions playing out in real time that students are digging into with a course he's designed specifically for the upcoming election. Because I thought that if I could get students to do original research on the election, that we would end up knowing more about this election than anybody else. And I'm really excited. They handed in their proposals today. We'll learn a lot about uh, political behavior, about campaign strategies, about how candidates raise funds. So really, really, it's more on the political side than about the big issues necessarily. What kinds of students have you found were attracted to this course? So what's been quite interesting is that uh, some of the students have an academic background in political science where they've been exposed to some of these ideas already. But one of the, the really amazing things about UTSC is that, that uh, a good number of our students are uh, new Canadians, some of whom are not citizens. And so talking about these issues is actually a way to kind of bring them into the political process and increase their civic literacy. Um, so that, that's been a really interesting experience for me at all levels, not just about this course, but to, to talk to people about elections who've maybe come from places where they don't have those things. Oh. Yeah. Um, so you mentioned the proposals that they've handed in. What? Tell me about how this course is going to shake out. How is it going to shake out? I don't know, and that's kind of the exciting part. There's a group of students who are very interested in how social media is being used as a campaign tool. So they're going to be doing analyses of the Twitter feeds and uh, social media presence of, of candidates. This is an area that, that some people have started to look at in, in American political campaigns, but I haven't really seen any literature at any level in Canada. I think they'll say something new and original with that. Um, another part of it, uh, another group of students are looking at the media. So do our newspapers cover the candidates and, and the issues in different ways? How do they cover the issues? How is gender and race treated in, in the news coverage. I think the different angles at which they're going to tackle that are going to be really exciting, and I think we'll learn something from that. So what has interested you about this election as we're moving into the last legs of it? Oh, where to start? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, there's all the obvious things, the events, the uh, extraordinary switcheroo of Rob and Doug Ford. What, what are we to make of that? There's the question of the stark reversal where Olivia Chow began in the lead and, and now... John Tory has, uh, as of some, at some point in July, he seems to have taken the lead away from her. Um, what I tell my students who, who maybe weren't uh, paying a lot of attention to what happened in previous elections is anything can happen. We're in, this, we're in a very fluid time in this last six weeks when people start to tune in. And you look back to previous elections. David Miller was, 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 uh, you know, didn't come into first place until the last three weeks or so of the campaign. Um, you know, anything can happen at this point. Uh, and uh, I think we're actually talking about real issues for a change, right? The transit thing is going to get shaken out. We're seeing people talk about housing and homelessness. Uh, we're seeing people talk about social issues. Um, so we'll see. We'll see. We'll see what happens there. So there's the theater of the election, I guess, right, which is, all, which is sort of the exciting and, and visual aspect of this. But on, a, on sort of the deeper, longer-term level, I remain interested in the city-suburb city divide, right? What, is it, what does it mean? Can we ever overcome it? Can we ever be one city, or are we a two-track city, two separate uh, trajectories, right, that, that pulls politics in opposite directions? I don't know. That's, that's what I'm interested in. Professor Zach Taylor teaches human geography at U of T's Scarborough campus. We'll check back with his students in later episodes. In the meantime, you can read more at news.utoronto.ca. From vehicles of the future to artificially intelligent traffic lights and drivers and pedestrians and bicyclists of varying degrees of intelligence, it's all part of the shifting nature of traffic in Toronto and around the world. 
We at the U of T Cities Podcast, we're happy to bring you these stories today as we introduce the podcast series. So glad you joined us. To learn more, please head over to U of T News at news.utoronto.ca. That's where you can find updates on innovative research and projects transforming cities, entrepreneurship, health, education, and more. Do you have a question about an election issue you'd like to have answered by a U of T expert? Well, you can tweet us at U of T News or send an email. That's U of T News at utoronto.ca. Since this is our first episode, we don't yet have any audience questions, so I'll throw this one at you. Where can you find more close conversations with U of T experts making the future of sustainable cities, transportation, civic diplomacy, and more? That's all coming up on the U of T Cities podcast. Today we featured music made available on the free music archive. The artists are Cheese and Pot C, The Silent Partner, and The Custodian of Records. This program was produced by me, Brianna Goldberg, with help from U of T News editor Jennifer Lantier. Thanks for listening.